Well, to discuss the latest twists and turns in the race for number 10, I'm joined from Westminster by Catherine Forster. She's a journalist at the Sunday Times and the Guardian column, columnist and author Owen Jones. Good afternoon to you both. Thanks a lot for coming in. Um, Michael Gove probably wanted us to be talking more about VAT than um, committing crimes, snorting cocaine. Um, he says he's fortunate enough not to have gone to prison, but how damaging do you think this is for his campaign, Owen? Well, it sh it, what should be damaging about it isn't the fact that he's admitted to doing something which, if, as a country, we would be honest, millions of people have done. Millions of people have taken illegal drugs at some point in their lives. But the hypocrisy of people like Michael Gove, who not only support policies which destroy the lives of other people for doing the exact same thing, but actually impose them. Michael Gove himself imposed a lifetime ban on teachers who took cocaine. And he's also a man, of course, who wrote articles uh, when he was a journalist uh, condemning the use of drugs and supporting the disastrous failure of the war on drugs. We, we, we have a situation where if you are a privileged white politician uh, in power and with influence, then you can dismiss taking drugs as almost hijinks, as a youthful indiscretion, that he wasn't that young at the time, uh, as just a bit of a joke or one of those things. I, I, he's allowed a life before politics, all that kind of stuff. Whilst the young black people in Hackney can be stopped and searched, found with drugs, and then have life-changing consequences, criminalised, struggling to find work, and indeed, if, for example, someone aspired to be a teacher, could have their career destroyed because of Michael Gove's policy. So I think if we're going to have a rational response to this, we should condemn the fact that if you are at the top of society and with power, you can take drugs and get away with it. But, but, but for so many other people, particularly disproportionately poorer and black people, then they are likely to have often their lives destroyed as a consequence. So if they want to stop being hypocrites, then let's have a national debate and conversation about ending the failed so-called war on drugs because this wanton hypocrisy with a parade of conservative politicians now coming out talking about the drug taking that they've they that, that they've had in their youth uh, whilst criminalizing so many other people for doing the same thing it's 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 an absurdity okay catherine what do you think do you think this is about crime or is it now hypocrisy well, I, I think it's about both. I mean, Michael Gove is very apologetic and deeply regrets it. But the bottom line is, although many people take drugs, there is a link between, as Sajid Javid was, was on Sophie Ridge this morning, saying uh, people, middle-class people, taking drugs at parties that get away with it. There is a link. I mean, Cressida Dick uh, once said... Um, People that take drugs have blood on their hands, which is obviously very strong. But, you know, there, there is truth in that. There is a link between taking drugs at a party and, you know, the drugs trade, people being thrown in jail, people losing their lives. And so I think it is very damaging. He was, of course, Justice Secretary. And so, you know, deeply involved in people um, being put in prison, often as a result of uh, the drugs trade. OK, so, Owen, where do we go from here? Do you think this should disqualify him, possibly, from the um, leadership campaign? Well, in a, in, a, in a just world, what should disqualify a politician from a position of power is to take drugs and then support criminalising and destroying the lives of others for doing the same thing. In a, we don't live in that just society, I'm afraid. But what if we were going to have a mature and rational conversation, we should talk about how the so-called war on drugs, ever since it started many decades ago, drug use has only exploded since. That has fueled massive criminal, criminality, just as prohibition did in the United States. Yeah, we should be talking about the thousands of people who've died because of the so-called war on drugs in the same way that so many people died because of prohibition in America, that instead we could talk about regulating drugs and taking it out of the hands of criminal gangs. Um, but instead we end up with a situation where if it is one rule for those at the top and it's one rule for everybody else, if you take drugs, you know, and as one commentator put together very eloquently, I thought, you know, if you did stop and search um, and applied it to conservative politicians, you'd actually have a very decent rate of success compared to, for example, all those young black people on the streets of Hackney or Moss Side who have often very aggressive stop and search with nothing on them because, uh, for a start, the government's own data shows that black people take drugs at a lower rate than white people but are far more likely to be stopped and searched on suspicion of having drugs. And if they're found with possession 
of either cannabis or cocaine, they are far more likely to be charged than a white person in the same situation. So that should be the debate. Yes, I think you should be disqualified, but I think they should all be disqualified for the same thing. But unfortunately, uh, you know, they will get away with this hypocrisy whilst every single year thousands of lives will be destroyed because of policies they support, because of behaviour that they themselves do. But it, 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 you can get away with it if you're a posh white Tory, but you can't if you're a young black man in, in, in Moss Side or Hackney. Do you agree, Catherine? Um, well, I don't think anybody is going to be disqualified um, for this. I mean, we now have a situation, I think six of the current 11 leadership candidates have admitted to um, taking drugs in some form, whether it's been cannabis or uh, cannabis larsi or whatever. Um, so I don't think that's going to happen at all. But I do think it's damaging for Michael Gove. And especially, you know, should he make the final two um, candidates where 160,000 members of the Conservative Party get to vote. I mean, lots of metropolitan people may not think this is a big deal, but the membership is really quite conservative and um, the average age is also very high. So I think this is damaging for him, definitely. Oh, and do you think if it does get down to Gove v Johnson, um, Johnson will win? I think he's got every chance of winning, and I have to say, you know, one of the, I, I'm afraid, big faults at the moment in this, in this whole debate is the lack of scrutiny of Boris Johnson, who is very likely to become the Prime Minister of this country in a matter of weeks. Why why aren't we asking, uh, does he still think that gay people should be called bum boys? Does he still think that equal marriage should be compared to, two me to three men marrying a dog? Does he still believe that black people should be called pickaninnies with watermelon smiles? Does he still think that it's acceptable to compare Muslim women to bank robbers and to letterboxes. Why should we trust somebody who was sacked twice for dishonesty, once by his newspaper and once by a Conservative leader? Is somebody who once conspired with a criminal friend to beat up a journalist fit for high office? Is somebody who wrote one column supporting Remain and another column supporting Leave, is that somebody who's driven by anything else other than his own career? We're not talking about these discussions. And I could go on, by the way, the fact that senior Conservative Conservative aides say that uh, when they, he was in meetings, he couldn't concentrate, he wasn't briefed, he was, a, he was an embarrassment, one of them said. One career diplomat described serving under him as foreign secretary is the only time he was embarrassed to represent his own country. But we're not having this discussion because all too often, I'm afraid to say, and I speak as somebody who has worked in the British media now for the best part of a decade, Boris Johnson is treated as a bit of a circus, a bit of a joke, a bit of a laugh, but he is somebody who has peddled racism, he's serially dishonest, he's a charlatan, but we're not having that conversation because, again, and it's worth emphasising this, if you are from a posh background, you can more or less get away with anything in this country. Catherine, what do you think? He has been, apart from this interview he's done this morning, he has been notably absent from this campaign, hasn't he? He has, and I think um, that's a deliberate policy because the biggest obstacle to Boris becoming Prime Minister is Boris himself. Um, Boris says things that perhaps he shouldn't say, um, sets the cat amongst the pigeons. So I think there's been a deliberate strategy of let's keep Boris out of the news. He's lost lots of weight. He's got a haircut. Um, he's looking more serious. He's given this interview to um, my paper, my colleague Tim Shipman in the Sunday Times today. Uh, which, in which we've learned, he says, I'm going to go, I'm not going to give the 39 billion unless we get a deal, I'm prepared to walk away, etc., etc. But I do think going forward, um, if we get, uh, you know, the television debates, we've learned what happened last time when the Conservative leadership, uh, you know, the, the process was curtailed when Andrea Ledson dropped out and we had Theresa May. Um, appointed by default, so to speak. And that didn't work out very well. I mean, she wasn't tested. She was a terrible campaigner. Look where that has got the Conservative Party. So I think it is really important that Boris should participate in the TV debates um, when they happen. I don't think he'll be that keen. Um, but I think we need to see him if he might well be Prime Minister of this country. Yeah, I mean, with, with all due respect, I think that contribution itself reveals part of the problem. We're more likely in the British media to hear people discussing him losing weight and getting a haircut than the fact that he once conspired uh, with a criminal uh, on, on the phone to talk about beating up a journalist or, for example, uh, being sacked for dishonesty, including by the Times newspaper, uh, your, your sister paper, for, for dishonesty. The fact that uh, he's, he's somebody who has peddled 
bigotry and racism. Once spoke, of course, not that long ago about, joked about clearing the bodies from Libya to turn it into a tourist resort. This is somebody who's regarded as an embarrassment across Europe. He reduced this country to, I mean, the many things you can say about Theresa May, and I have said them, but one of the, one of the many abject things she did is appoint this clown and a dangerous clown as foreign secretary. And, and I, I just think all too often the superficial coverage, you can, if you, you know, a guy is posh and, 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 and speaks a bit of Latin and has swallowed a thesaurus and ruffles your hair occasionally like this, you can more or less get away with anything. And, the, and, and half the political lobby go gooey at the knees. It's absurd. Um, Owen and Catherine, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. But uh, thank you both for coming on this afternoon. Thank you.